you know how sometimes you have a lot of data, maybe in a table, and you're trying to figure out how to compare those different values, and maybe there's a lot of them, maybe you don't want to make a chart, maybe you want to make a table, but you also don't want to give everybody all of the numbers? Well, that's a case where a heat map might come into use. And on today's episode of the One Chart at a Time video series, we have Ava Murray, who helps run the Makeover Monday project, to help explain how to read, how to use, and even create your own heat map. I think they're a great way to visualize my own data. I use them all the time, both in my formal publication process and also just as I'm using them on my own. But Eva's gonna give you the rundown on how to use the heat map. Hello everyone, my name is Eva Murray. I'm a tech evangelist at Excel and a Tableau Zen master. I love talking about data. I love talking about data visualization. And today I'm here to talk about heat maps. What is a heat map? It's a two-dimensional data visualization. It's a chart where you show two different dimensions on um, in basically a table format, but you add color to make it much easier for people to comprehend what information actually stands out, what's important. The best way to explain that is to actually show you a picture, and I'll also share what you should keep in mind when you create your own heat maps. In this visualization I built a little while ago, we look at a timeline of Silicon Valley's growth, also looking at the number of evictions of tenants from rental properties. And in this heat map, we have our different suburbs on the, um, on the rows, and then across on the, if the years are across on the columns. And what this heat map shows is a few points in time for different suburbs where something significant seem to, seems to have happened. One that stands out for me is when Twitter moves into San Francisco in 2012 and we see that in South of Market there are a lot more evictions compared to the 1997 baseline. In fact, as you see in this tooltip, there are 624% more. Well, Twitter happens to have their office in South of Market. So people might get evicted because the landlords want to have higher paying tenants in their property. And this is a really good opportunity for them to hike up the price. Now, what this heat map does is that even if you don't have numbers displayed in each cell, you see that there's something interesting going on in specific cells. And each cell is an intersection of a suburb and a year. So you can explore what happened and then come to your own conclusions if it's not available in the data set. Another example is the use of coal in the UK. Now you see here um, that we have the months across the top. So each month is one column and then the date of the month going down on the rows. And over the years from 2012 to 2019, summer more specifically, um, there seems to be a decrease in the reliance on coal, as can be seen by the color becoming lighter and lighter. So on the dark days, there was a lot of coal being used. And as we go more towards the recent years, there are actually days where zero coal was being used for power generation. So the green days show that zero coal demand. And again, the heat map shows us what the interesting data points are. In essence, this is a table because behind each of those colored cells is a number, is a fact. Uh, but if we had just numbers in these cells, it would be so hard to spot patterns. It would be impossible, really. And it also wouldn't be very interesting to look at. The way that I would recommend using a heat map is to draw people's attention and to then give them maybe in a next step or through the tooltips like I've shown the information that they are after, some of the details, uh, some of the numbers, and let them explore the data that way. Grab their attention with a really well-colored heat map and then give them the details so they truly understand the entire story. What should you pay attention to? Well, firstly, should you have lines around each cell? Should the cells have borders or not? I tend to use borders because I find it looks really neat. Um, but you could remove the borders and you would just get this overall um, effect of color gradient depending on what the data is in your data set. But that is one thing to consider. And then the other one is what is a logical display for your data? Is it, um, you know, what should you put on columns? What should you put on rows? In the examples of the coal free days, I'm using the months on columns and the days for my rows because for me, that's a logical calendar display. 
I wouldn't necessarily do it the other way around. Also, if I go back to my timeline of Silicon Valley's growth, again, I chose to use the years or the time dimension on the columns and then the other dimension on rows, because to me, time always goes left to right. Those are two key things to consider. How do you design your heat map? Do you, do you make sure that every cell is visible as an individual cell by creating a border, be it white, gray, black, etc.? Or do you remove the borders? And then how do you structure the table in terms of rows and columns? So I look forward to seeing some heat maps out there in the wild, and I hope you found this useful. Thanks to Eva for that great explanation of how heat maps work and how to read them. I think they're a great visualization tool, especially in my own data analytics process. So I hope you'll be able to use them in your own data. And so until tomorrow, this has been the One Chart at a Time video series. Stay tuned for more.